Well, hi there, and welcome to Point of View. I'm Mark Leishman, and uh, the more I watch it, the more nervous I became. Okay. 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 I grew up in the middle of Auckland. I'm in the Kiribati industry. It's a very hard ask for that production to a level. Hi there and welcome. This is Point of View. I'm Mark Leishman and welcome to the program. And my subject this week is crop logic, which gathers data via wireless networks and satellite systems from sensors in the field and then processes that information, providing lots of support and predictions for applications of crops. So we're going to talk about crop logic with its CEO, Jamie Cairns. Welcome to the program, Jamie. Thanks, Mike. Tell us a wee bit about um, crop logic, I guess the history of it. Um, yeah, look, the company came out of um, Lincoln, well, actually plant and food research back in uh, back in 2010. There was there was some IP there around, you know, predictive plant modelling and whatnot, and we managed to get that IP, um, take it out of the uh, out of the organisation itself. Powerhouse came on board at that point, a uh, venture capital type of organisation, and um, capitalised that business. And you know, essentially, a new venture was created back in 2010. So, what essentially does does crop logic do? I mean, uh, I sort of alluded to it at the beginning. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, let's, let's get the real <laughs> the real deal now. Uh, look, essentially, I mean, what you said is, is dead correct. Um, what we're doing is uh, we're looking to provide a system for growers of uh, large crop growers. Uh, to help them optimise their, their yields, um, really diagnose some issues and things that are going on along the way. But essentially having people out there in the field and complementing that with some really high tech stuff that we've pulled out of plant and food a while back. So how does the, the grower actually use your system? Is it just monitors in the field? No, it's not just monitors in the field. This is one of our differentiators really. Um, you know, we've got some pretty neat tech which we put out in the field and what we do is we use that to uh, acquire data. So say things like soil moisture, soil temperature, some of the um, sort of atmospheric type stuff going on in the field too. Mm -hmm. uh, we take that back and uh, that data all gets put back into the cloud. Uh, where we can use these these algorithms and that technology we took out of plant and food to analyse um, you know what's going on, uh, and also to extrapolate what uh, the yield is potentially going to look like at the end of the season. So uh, between the technology um, and our field force there, we've got people in the field as well. Uh, we've got a bit of a differentiated solution, I think, compared to others. Uh, look, on top of that, we've also got aerial imagery going on. We've um, we've been the recipient of a of a Callahan grant over the past um, couple of years. Uh, and that's really allowed us to form a decent IP position around around aerial imagery, which, as you know, is, is reasonably important. So, is this using drones, or how, how uh, look, we've um, the majority of our research has been around drones. Um, we've actually spent the most of our time in the US market, and I think uh, once somebody hits the US market, they kind of realise that the scale over there is just far bigger than what we've got over here. Yeah. So, we were finding we were taking a couple of hours maybe to um, to image a, a potato field with a drone. Uh, you know, when you add in the post-processing time as well, stitching all those images together and then all the consequences of that, of the image processing too, uh, we found that fixed wing is just a, a far better alternative over there. Oh, really? Yep. Uh, got our eye on satellite, of course, but um, right now the resolution from fixed wing is really, is really uh, beneficial from us. So when you say fixed wing, I mean, that is drones or is that, a, that is an aeroplane? That's an aeroplane. Aeroplane. So, I mean, that's, that's the old way, wasn't it? Uh, it's, it's the old way, but you know what? It's, um, it's, it's tried, it's proven, it works really well. Yeah, really? yeah. Uh, like I say, we haven't, we definitely haven't taken our eye off other things like satellite and drones, but um, you know, just for the scale of, of operations, what's going on in the US market, we're, we're more than happy with fixed wing at the moment. And are you doing that in New Zealand as well? Uh, no, the majority of our work has been in the US. Like I say, we've done some field trials and things over the years. In fact, you know, the majority of those five, six years of um, of company life cycle, I guess, uh, has been around R and D. Mm. Uh, but when it comes to actually generating revenue, uh, US is the first port of call for us. Yeah, good, excellent stuff. Well, what about your own background? Tell us about where you come from and what you've been up to before yeah, you uh, got into I, crops. Uh, before I got into crops, I, I grew up on a, on a dairy farm uh, in the Horofenua around sort of Tokamaru, um, Horofenua or almost Manawatu. I yes. uh, went to university there, uh, Massey University. Uh, I think my first job was in uh, working for the Ag Hort faculty at that point. Yes. Uh, and then basically moved from there, went to the, uh, went to the UK. My, my mum and dad are both English, so I was lucky enough to have a passport and be able to spend some time over there. Uh, that passport also allowed me to work for the Ministry of Defence over there, which was um, you know, quite a, an eye-opener from a boy from oh Palmerston goodness. North. Quite a contrast to uh, very, working on a dairy farm or whatever. Big contrast, absolutely. Yeah, 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 but um, look, that gave me a, a really good opportunity to, um, you know, I started contracting for these guys and then employing some people. So we kind of got used to that whole that whole business dynamic over there. 
mm-hmm. uh, before coming back to New Zealand, uh, and I was lucky enough to be working for a crowd that bought a company called Snap Internet down in Christchurch. Mm-hmm. Um, at that, that point, the company was uh, it was pretty embryonic, to say the least, and uh, you know we managed to take that from from you know that embryonic type of company right the way through to the the revenue and, a, and an exit at the other end. Um, you know, so Telco started you know for me about that time, yeah. uh, and then I was working with Vodafone for. About a year as GM of Southern Region for them, yes. uh, before working for Canterbury Development Corporation. Uh, it's quite interesting because the CDC's got a or had a policy of um, you know being able to direct invest in these uh, these high tech startups from the region. So CropLogic was actually part of that portfolio. So I was able to watch this thing before realising they needed another CEO. Oh, really? uh, I put myself forward for it. Oh, good on you! Oh, what a what a what a great journey! Amazing journey. So, um, you know, the, the company, um, you've got through the R&D stage, or, or I imagine that's an, an ongoing? It's definitely ongoing, definitely yeah. ongoing. Yeah. So where are you at at the moment? Uh, look, the company's taken a big, a big leap over the past couple of years. Um, we've, we've changed the board structure. We've, um, we've taken, well, I'm on board now as well, slightly different uh, to previous CEOs with the company, but it really has shifted from an R&D to a, um, a commercialisation phase, mm-hmm. phase now. Uh, we've always been working in the US and we've been doing quite a lot of you know, field trials and, and work over there. And, and that includes the crop side of things, not just the... Not the... Uh, and just recently, in fact, today we announced that we'd purchased a business over there in the US. Um, you know, that's, that's really the footprint that we're going to build upon. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's where the majority of the revenue, obviously, for the company is coming from as, as of today. So that's an agronomy that's company. An agronomy uh, tell us stuff. about that company. Yeah, so these guys are out there. They've got... Um, Professional Ag Services right. Incorporated. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they are you know, an agronomy service company. They've got about 16 staff. Um, they're servicing about 100,000 acres over there. So I think you know, just from off the bat, that figure alone is enough to say you know, why we did this. Yes. Uh, about 60,000 of those are high value crops, um, in particular potatoes. Um, you know, southeast Washington is yeah. um, you know, quite near Idaho Washington and State. Oregon as well. Yeah. Washington State, yeah. Um, so we're right in the middle of potato country over there. Yeah. Um, potatoes are the first, the first crop that we've um, that we've tried to commercialise as well. Uh, that's the one that we've got the models for, so it all just fits quite nicely. Uh, you know, over the past five years, it has been an R and D company, but we have been building up relationships with the um, with the processors over there and some of the other key stakeholders. So this acquisition, really for us, is is us um, cementing our commitment, yeah, <laughs> I guess, yes. or confirming that commitment Absolutely. to the US. What does it mean to have a, an agronomy company as part of the family, as it were? Uh, well, these guys, for us, you know, for the for the five years, we've had a lot of technology in the stable. Um, the problem that others have faced is is getting technology and selling it into um, into a farm, past the farm gate. Uh, for us, our approach is is realising very well that there's established relationships already in place. Uh, we're also very cognizant of the fact that our technology won't pick up absolutely everything out there. You know, there's always circumstances which are going to require somebody to actually go and have a look and see what's going on. So we're not um, we're not at the stage now, and I don't think we'll we'll get to the stage where we just say right we don't need a field force anymore. We're just going to do this all via technology and via you know remote monitoring. Um, really, for the for us, this has given us that field force that we needed to be able to push the technology. Out. So basically, you, you you've now got a company that that the the croppers and that are familiar with. They know it. They go to it for advice. <laughs> And then you can impart your knowledge and your technology. That That's you right. Get. And you know, the um, with our technology, one of the first things that we can do, one of the first things that we can change significantly, is just the way that that agronomy service company does business itself. Yeah. I mean, you think about these um, these large farms, and I'll just give you um, just a, a little bit of perspective scale. here, a bit of a scale thing. Yeah. Uh, the first potato grower that I visited over there in Washington State, we walked into his first field, and it was a 140 acre centre pivoted field. I mean, that's Quite big. <laughs> Asking him how many fields he has. With one pivot or is it? <laughs> Huge. Uh, it is, it is. Uh, so I ask him how many. Completely flat, I presume. Oh, it's, it's, it's semi rolling, semi rolling actually, yeah. but um, yeah, broad, quite flat compared to yeah. some of the things we've seen. Yeah, exactly. uh, but anyway, asking this guy how many other fields he's got, he's got another 220 of these fields. So for, um, for us to be able to, or if you imagine that agronomy service company who's got to go out there, put eyes on that field, yeah. you know, once or twice a week, taking soil moisture readings, whatever else, uh, the logistics around that business are really quite intensive. Yeah. So for us, having something that's reliable out there in the field that can start reducing the amount of time that they need to spend driving from field to field and yeah. maybe increasing the amount of time that they're spending with the farmer, 
um, that's really quite important and it represents a big change. So the, the technology that you've developed here, with the crop logic technology, is what yeah. you'll be using with your new agronomy company in, in the US and Correct. going out to these big farms. And yeah, um, the first port of call for us is all around the soil moisture. Um, that's just an easy, easy win for us really. Yeah. Um, the model that we've got is far more predictive. Um, so we can start extrapolating out exactly what the conditions are today, what some of the decisions have been made in the past, and work out what the impact of that is going to be on yield. And that's the next stage for us. So for us, really, um, buy the business, transform it, build up the efficiencies and uh, profitability, obviously, uh, before pushing in this additional service further on down the track. Have you found that, I mean, is it, is it proven already um, with, with, I guess, local... Growers. Yeah, well, these guys that we've um, these guys that we've acquired, they've been working with our technology for about a year and a half. They've seen a couple of seasons already with um, within potatoes, and they're quite comfortable. Um, you know, they've used our technology and they've used their older technology uh, right next to each other. They're quite happy with the results. So, you know, it's really a win-win. And I mean, that's being used here as well. Uh, look, I'm, I'll be honest with you. I think um, the, the size of the market over there has always meant that we were going to focus on the US market before New Zealand. Um, we have done a lot of field trials in New Zealand, we've done a whole lot of field trials in New Zealand, but realistically, um, it's a bit more R&D that's done here before being pushed out into, into the US market. So local farmers really can't use... Oh, they can, farmers. absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. But, you know, we've been quite a small company. We've, yeah. We're still a company of only seven employees uh, yeah. so far, well, excluding the, uh, the US organisation. Yeah. But for us, we've never been about just putting technology into fields and, you know, handing yeah. the farmer an iPad and walking away. Yeah. Uh, it's yeah. always been about that field force, so we've really had to have that there. Um, are there any uh, similar companies in, in New Zealand? Um, oh, there's, there's numbers of people that are, you know, well, we'll just talk about globally here. Um, there's, there's quite a few companies out there which just put probes in fields and pretty much do exactly what I just said. Um, you know, provide that data and here's your, here's your app and you can now monitor your fields. But there's, um, there's actually quite a, um, uh, there's, there's not many out there that have actually got a field force there. And the problem with that is that if something happens outside the model, then it's pretty hard to react to it. You know, the first thing that you would do if you can see that there's a problem with what you're monitoring out in the field is call an agronomist. Mm. Well, yeah. <laughs> we've got the agronomist. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. you know, that really is the, um, that's the reason why we wanted that end-to-end -end type of solution there. Why, why do you think other companies perhaps struggle to convert their technology into revenue? Um, I think that pushing technology into a, um, particularly into the rural sector, it's, it's always going to be difficult. I mean, if you don't, you've got to, you've got to have that relationship to, to make the initial sale for a start. Mm -hmm. um, walking away and leaving these growers when they've been used to having somebody, having an expert talking with them, having an expert able to just make the casual observation yep. um, has been you know, something that just disappears when you push out a technology solution and yep. say, well, this is what you're working from now. So I think that um, you know, that channel to market, the path to market that we're using through the acquisitions and through mm -hmm acquiring these relationships is, is really quite different. Excellent. My guest is, is Jamie uh, Cairns and, uh, from Crop Logic, and we're going to have another 15 minutes or so with uh, Jamie coming up right after this break. We're going to find out about uh, a big uh, IPO that has been launched and also a bit more about the acquisition in the US. This is Point of View. We'll join you back very shortly. Welcome back. This is Point of View. I'm Mark Leishman. Our guest is Jamie Cairns. She's the CEO of Crop Logic. And Jamie, uh, you recently completed a, a two million dollar pre-IPO fundraise. How did how did you go about raising that capital? Uh, yeah, well, that process that process was uh, quite interesting. Really, it was almost my first foray into the capital markets. Um, look, it was we filled it out in the end actually really quite quickly with our with our chosen broker. We chose um, our engaged Hunter Capital out of out of Sydney. Um, and essentially what they did is put us in front of some of the bigger fund managers and whatnot in, in Sydney and Melbourne and we managed to close that out within about two and a half days. But before we uh, say, you know, two and a half days, that's fantastic, there was a lot of pre-work before that. Uh, I would say that the, um, the main job, or my main role for this past year since I've been on board has really been around capital and establishing it and, um, you know, getting a, a decent, decent path towards listing later on this year. So why did you choose the Australian Securities Exchange and a, a Sydney company? As was there a reason for that? Look, if we if we look at the requirements of getting onto the uh, the NZX main board over here, we're looking at a you know 50 million market capitalisation. 
we're not there. <laughs> we're not there yet. And it's going to take us, I don't know, maybe a couple of years or whatever to get there. It'll take us a little while to get there. Um, however, the, uh, the ASX, you know, they don't have those same types of market capitalization requirements. Um, you know, and it means that we can go on as an early company and we can be sitting alongside a, a BHP or whoever else on the, on the ASX there. Um, we did, there was an alternative with the, the NXT market here in, or the NXT board here in New Zealand as well. Um, but look, I think it's, it's probably just in its infancy at the moment. It didn't really suit us at the time. It's not shunning New Zealand at all. It's, um, it's really just the circumstances suited us to go to the Australian market first. And when you say today, as you, know, as you say, there's a lot of work that went into that, but what was the reaction from the market? Obviously, it's pretty positive. Look, the, the message has always been received pretty well. Um, the, the two and a half days really, I think, was a result of, of Hunter getting us in front of the right people. Um, who really understood ag and I'll, I'll tell you right now it's it's difficult well it's not difficult but you really know that you can tell it immediately if somebody understands ag or not mm -hmm. um, you know those brokers you know, they tend to see many different businesses from many different sectors yes. to be fair yes. but so I'd like to think that ag is slightly different to the others and yes. um, you yes. know, on that basis alone you really know those that have dealt in ag and those that haven't. In Australia itself is that, I mean is that it's another market for you? Um, is, uh, look, we've been reasonably open about our plans in Australia as well, and that is that we would look to do another acquisition um, or two mm. uh, to establish some presence over there. Again, there's no point us sitting as a New Zealand company trying to direct sell into a foreign market like that. That's much much less of a risk to shareholders, mm. uh, as far as we're concerned, to actually go out there, buy that client base and start from there. Is this a model that's, that's been is pretty common, or not necessarily, or is it something yeah. that you've decided is the best way to, to gain access to? Uh, I don't think it's. I don't think it's necessarily uncommon. It might be uncommon from a for a tech company to be doing this thing. Um, you know, roll up plays and things are, are very common. Um, I would I would hasten to add this is not a roll up play. Uh, ours is not just growth by acquisition. We're looking to, uh, like I said before, introduce these efficiencies and grow these businesses out organically. Uh, but for us, establishing a foothold in these strategic locations is incredibly important. So why muck around trying to direct sell into, you know, build up relationships when we can just go and buy them? Yeah. It's um, you know it's a much better platform to be building with yeah. uh, upon, and you know these founders uh, say for example with uh, with Proag this first one that we're doing there they've been in that industry for thirty years yeah. you know, they know, know everybody there they're staying on with the business they've bought on with the business they can see where we're going they're excited and and what to, what do you see you will bring apart from your technology um, what will you bring to say a company like the American Proag. Well, the technology is a is a big thing. I mean, for these guys, if we talk specifically about Proag, you know, they these guys built that business from just the two of them. And were they keen to to sell, or were they, or, uh, or did you come in with an idea that just appealed to them? Well, we came in with an idea that that, that appealed to them definitely. Um, you know, they they're. Uh, what, the 58 years old right now, they could see this was going to be their retirement nest egg. So I don't think that they were ever desperate to sell. Um, it was just that we've had that relationship with them for the past couple of years. They can see that we can not only offer them the technology, but the capital backing as well. So all of a sudden now, instead of being capital constrained in their growth plans, we get to provide them the tech, provide them the capital, and they can really get on and do what they'd always intended to do with that business. Pretty exciting stuff for them, presumably for them as well, isn't it? Oh, it is definitely. It is, yeah, yeah absolutely. So where do you see, what's the, what's the next plan or path? Uh, for Proag or for that acquisition over there in the US? Well, let's, try, let's talk about the acquisition first. Well, look, building out, building out from Washington is, is the big thing. We've got Idaho sitting right next to us as well. Plenty of potatoes there. <laughs> Plenty of potatoes there, that's right. Um, we've got a good relationship with, uh, with Lamb Weston up there, the large uh, processor. Uh, and we're looking just to leverage those relationships as much as we can and, um, and use that as a basis for pushing out into Idaho, into Oregon, uh, and then down into, down into the southern states, I think, with some different crop types. Is there a timeline, or, you, you, or is that too, too scary? Look, I think um, the potato season is, is well underway right now in the US market. Uh, so these guys are incredibly busy. They're, it's 12-hour days for them at the moment. Uh, we'll be looking to increase that revenue, definitely, uh, by the start of the next season. Um, but um, in terms of committing to a time frame, in terms of you know acquisitions and things, is quite difficult. So, um, what, what other plans do you have in mind? Uh, well, Australia is definitely one of them, mm -hmm. and um, you know if we if we're listing in, uh, in August, then we'll be looking to significantly build out that development team uh, based here in New Zealand, of course. Uh, and we've also got some plans for China and uh, some of the other emerging markets, you know, further on down the track. Now this is, uh, you know, with, with seven staff at the moment. But you've got to remember that each one of these acquisitions that we do, you know, say for example, Proag, we just picked up 16 staff right there. 
and so you know yeah. the, the founders were not were not out there looking to buy you know loss leader businesses or no. you know these are businesses which are profitable which have established trading histories yeah. so you can pretty much assume that those founders are going to be reasonably competent in their ability to grow yeah. a business yeah. so we are looking to leverage that a lot but to also put in place some um, you know business development uh, muscle I guess um, from a central office type um, perspective and, I mean you, you you will stay in New Zealand I mean is this the, the plan is I think so my kids are in Medbury I'm not gonna yeah. leave too soon <laughs> yeah so life is here so that, that, that's again I guess part of the attraction that you can do that take on the world from here yeah um, look I don't, I don't yeah I have been asked this question you know particularly relevant to that US market yeah. um, when, we're when it looks US. like you're looking over there all the time exactly and we've been you know when we've spoken with US uh, investors the question has been well you, when you're going to move to the US well you know even if I did move to the US it would probably only be a six month strategy anyway because then we're looking at China then yes, we're looking exactly. at Australia then we're looking at whoever else and I think you know to expect the uh, the CEO to be based in one area is, is yeah. just a, it's not going to work in a company like this. So let's just recap on, on what exactly crop logic does. What are you bringing to ProAg in the US and to whichever company in Australia, whichever company in China? What are you going to, what, what's the, the, the technology that will, will change their lives effectively, or enhance their profits? It really is a twofold story here. I mean, for these acquisitions, that technology allows them to significantly reduce the amount of time that they're spending out there in the fields. So from that perspective alone, we're talking about a transformation of a, of a business model, really, which is why we're acquiring. So currently, someone in a farm in Washington State he hasn't got your technology yet. He, what's he having to do in, in terms of hours in a day out there in the field? Well, these growers will usually employ the services of an agronomy service company, um, and they'll be out there physically in a field looking at these crops. Um, you know, acetate testing soil, um, soil moisture readings. Um, you know, even nitrogen levels. Perhaps looking at um, at you know disease, pests, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so for us, what we're able to do is we're able to start systemising some of that um, some of that checking that's going on there. Um, so you have in the field the technology. We do. Yep. Getting the and the readings are going into the cloud, Correct. and your agronomist is sitting back in the office, and they can do it from there. Yeah, if you if you imagine that agronomist has um, has been spending his time driving from field to field to field to get these yes. readings, uh, he's been using these um, you know particular this particular method that they use uh, because that's the thing that they trust. Yes. So for the agronomist to want to actually get out of the field, he's got to be able to trust the value that the values uh, the readings that he's actually getting out of that field. Uh, at any one time. If he can't trust it, he might as well go back to what he's doing before. He's got to get out there into the field. Mm -hmm. So really for us, we're turning the job of that agronomist into a management by routine, going yeah. out there every single week, to management by exception, when you can actually see something's happening out there in the field. I know something's going on out there in the field. We need to get out there and have a look. I mean, it's not about completely eliminating the amount of time that these guys are spending out there in the field, mm. but certainly cutting it down by half has a massive effect on that business model. And the, and the farmers, have, you found they sort of think, oh, I'm not seeing anybody. What's, <laughs> I, I want to see someone out there seemingly working. Yeah, um, look, it's not, about, um, it's not about reducing the level of service that these farmers are getting at no. all. In fact, it, actually, it's increasing right. it. Yeah. Um, you know, instead of, instead of getting these point-in-time readings from, uh, from these probes out there or from the agronomists that go out there, yeah. uh, they're now getting these real this real-time data. They can, see exactly, right. they can see exactly what's going on out there. Yeah. Um, and on top of that, you know, you've still also got the aerial imagery um, stuff going on as well. So, so this is all complementary? It's all complementary, yeah. exactly. And it's actually increasing the amount of information. Yeah. Um, that that farmer's getting. But we're still keeping that agronomist in the chain because the agronomist knows how to convert that data into something meaningful for the uh, grower. What about the, the aerial technology you talk about? How do, how do you use that? Yeah, multi-spectrum um, imaging is effectively what we're doing and we're looking for, we're looking for just changes in, the, um, in the, the plant growth patterns. Um, you know, from the aerial imagery you can pick up just such simple things as problems with irrigation when you start seeing patterns of, you know... Dry areas or whatever. Exactly, exactly. Um, weed outbreaks, pest outbreaks, um, you know, a lot of the time that's where you're going to see it first is from aerial imagery. Um, you know, in terms of the plant health though, it's really underground that you get to you get to see that as early as possible that's right so farmers watching this program will be thinking oh, I like the sound of this how can I how can I be a part of it can they uh, they could well be a part of it in New Zealand yeah. uh, they could well be a part of it um, soon 
But yeah. uh, like I say, all the focus has been on me. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, look, Australian's probably going to happen before New Zealand, unfortunately, but you may actually see um, you know, crop logic out there and researching and um, yeah. doing some work with... You might get phone calls saying, I want to be a guinea pig. I'll be you. <laughs> hey, well, that would actually be quite well received. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Jamie, lovely to chat with you. And thanks so much for, for joining us and uh, making the effort to come from, from Christchurch to, to be with us. And uh, good luck with crop logic. It sounds a fantastic future. Fantastic. Thanks very much. Jamie Cairns, who is the CEO of Crop Logic. And that is our point of view. We'll have another point of view at the same time next week. We'll see you then.